Um, I followed the House of Ushers. So, uh, <laughs> this is my third attempt at a breakdown <laughs> of the events of the fall of the House of Usher. Um, and the challenge is to find it is to find the active moments in a story that feels very much about receiving information and that can feel quite passive, particularly when we're seeing everything from behind the eyes of the narrator. Um, so my solution or my interpretation as I started trying to find the active components of these passive seeming moments was to recognize the house's sentience, which is exposed at the end, and yet, if it's true at the end, it's true the whole time. So um, I started thinking of the house as an active person, or an active character. Um, and the first thing that happens in the story, it seems, is that the narrator <coughs> approaches the house, and the house says, stay away. Um, Get out. <laughs> Get out. Don't come near. Um, uh, the house's mode of communication is a little bit indirect, though, so the narrator starts fighting it off, saying he's not really hearing this. Um, so he's combating the gloomy feeling in, in many, many different kinds of ways, um, trying to fight off this feeling. Um, he fortifies himself. The narrator steals himself. He invokes memories in order to justify the fact that he is approaching the house, despite the fact that the house is saying, stay away. Reminds himself of Roderick's letter, cites the memory of Roderick's family and disposition. He reasons with himself that Roderick's personality matches the house perfectly, and maybe one malady influences the other. He does succumb for just a moment to the atmosphere, and then he shakes it off. Um, the house is attempting to terrify the narrator for an instant. It intensifies its atmosphere, reveals that it's a sentient being for just a minute. Nevertheless, the narrator enters the house. The house greets him, disempowers him, a servant takes his horse, disorients him, a valet meets him and silently guides him through a maze, um, intimidates him with the physician, and delivers him to the studio. In the studio, the narrator, having thus been <coughs> disempowered, weakened, and disoriented, um, grasps to uh, get his orientation back. He's trying to hide his initial reactions, trying to maintain his composure, um, tries to hide his shock at how different Roderick appears from how he remembers him. Um, Roderick pleads with the narrator for help. Um, Roderick is actively fighting the house's hold on him as he appeals to the narrator. He explains his family malady, explains his own enslavement, enslavement to fear, hints at the house's sentient power over him. The house shuts that down real quick um, and discloses the plight of his sister. Madeline, meanwhile, is fighting her own battle. Madeline is trying to break free. She leaves her room. She tries to find her way out of the house. The house toys with her, lets Roderick and the narrator see her, but does not allow her to see them, and then swallows her up again. The narrator tries to cheer Roderick up, tries to inspire him with some artistic activity, painting, music, literature, but Roderick is busy trying to exercise himself of the house, so he's trying to redeem himself through art, but all that he can produce is disturbing abstractions and aberrations. The house makes fun of Roderick's efforts. The house explains itself very clearly, but these guys don't really receive it very well. The house does not allow Roderick any pleasure in music except for some discordant guitar and the song The Haunted Palace. Um, the house uses this song to enlighten the narrator um, as to what's actually going on. Lays it straight out for him. Here's what's happening. Um, I'm pissed. This is the narrative. Once things were beautiful, things have devolved. Um, the house convinces Roderick that it is alive. The narrator tries to prevent Ro Roderick's demise, invokes literature, comedic stories, social satires, religious and mystic texts, but Roderick is mainly interested in searching for redemption and his last rites, particularly in that ancient lost Catholic text, which is the last one in that long, long list. Um, this is something that I want to research more, just to put that out there. The, the art and music section is really, really dense. It's very listy, and I think there's a lot to unpack there. The house kills Madeline, except it doesn't. Um, Roderick is trying to protect Madeline and himself. He buries her deep underneath the house. He reveals the secret that they're twins. He banishes his own knowledge that she's still alive, and he enters into an active argument with the house. He, he's leaving the dimension of reality with the narrator and entering into the dimension of reality with the house. The house summons its full power. It fortifies itself. It breathes deep. It summons the sky and the water and the air. It stirs deep into the earth. The narrator takes shelter and tries to shield Roderick from the coming onslaught. The house awakens Madeline. Narrator calms Roderick with a story. <clears throat> Madeline breaks out of the coffin. Roderick suc succumbs to a full communion with the house. Madeline claws her way to the surface. From there, the house claims the ushers. Um, 
Roderick proclaims Madeline's return. The house busts open its jaws. Madeline tries to prevent the house from taking her brother, and the house destroys them both. The narrator flees, and the house destroys itself. So that's how I've broken down a more active interpretation of the story, and it's pretty fun. Cool. <laughs>